Hash mark. I, Bait Engineer. My name is Daniel. Some call me the Data Generator, and I'm building Pipeline Data Engineering Academy, the world's first data engineering bootcamp. Not one of today's data engineers grew up as a kid imagining becoming one. I definitely didn't. That made me think about how others look at our line of work, and I feel the best way to explain it is through asking a handful of practitioners about their journey and how they work look like. Who are you and what do you do now? I'm Zoltan Toth, and at the moment I'm the CEO of a small data consultancy called Data Power. And what we do, and that's pretty much what I do, is that we help companies go through their data journey. So we do a lot of trainings and also we do a lot of data engineering services, basically, and data engineering consultants. Mostly what what I've been doing in the past years, besides of managing this company, so the, the professional part is, is pretty much about Apache Spark and cloud migration projects. So this is really what, what I'm into at the moment, I do work a lot with Databricks, the technology, and also Databricks, uh, the company. And also, we have a few projects where we work on on-prem, mostly Spark installations. And sometimes we, we get into random stuff. By random stuff, I mean, for example, we have a project going on right now, which is uh, machine learning in pharmaceutical manufacturing. We also have another, which I took part, which was machine learning in automotive manufacturing. But I would say it's really distributed systems and the Apache Spark, what what I do on a daily basis. How did you end up as a data engineer? So that's a long story. This this started in around 2000s when I was 19. I applied for a job so just to cover, you know, university cost as a web developer. But I was like, I, I had some coding skills in Pascal. Uh, but then I picked up PHP at that time, as everyone has. And this company was a pharmaceutical market research company. And as we started to work together, well, obviously it turned out that their, their profile is not really web. They just needed interface for operator companies. And also they grew into a pretty big pharmaceutical data collection company. So they just needed a web interface for, for doctors and practitioners so they can upload their data. At that time, we even had a lot of floppies coming in my post. Yeah. We needed some system to, to get the operators just put in the floppies and copy all the prescription data and anonymize it and all that. So it pretty much turned out to be you know, a data engineering job. I was lucky, well, I was lucky already there that I could do some data, but that was mostly, you know, SQL. So we had to do a lot of PHP, a lot of SQL and reporting. So reporting was already uh, already something that we had to work a lot on, like in PHP, creating chart generation. That was before the fancy libraries we have today. So uh, we did that a lot. And then, then later I, I graduated uh, in computer science and uh, I was really obsessed with human computer interaction, pretty much like usability. And I tried to get a job as a UX researcher, actually that time that, that weren't really a job title like this as today, but I, I really tried to get there. That was in Amsterdam, but then I, I moved back to Budapest. I just couldn't get any. After all, I got hired by a startup company, which was at the time it wasn't famous, but got famous in Hungary, at least later uh, called Prezi. I got hired as a data analyst. And I was the first full-time data analyst and I tried to do some, you know, user research, but it turned out that actually as a first full-time data analyst with an engineering background, I got to build my own infrastructure there. <laughs> so it also turned out that, um, well, if I want to be nice with myself, I would say I'm a, a pretty average data analyst, but I was quite good in data infrastructure. So then, then I got there. The company became uh, quite famous and data driven. It, it is a San Francisco Budapest company. So we had to scale. And at one point we had to replace oral data infrastructure to a distributed system. And Hadoop was the thing that time. It's a horrible technology, but that was pretty much the only technology we could use. So it scaled. It had a lot of problems, but it scaled. Later, I got into a management role, but then I wanted to go back to tech. And there was this company called Rapid Miner, which is kind of famous if you're a data scientist. And Spark was just picking up that time. Rapid Miner was looking for someone who would kick off their Spark integration. And I was looking for a part-time job where I can work with Spark. So it seemed to be like an absolute match. I went to and started working uh, for Rapid Miner. And then also it seemed that people want to learn about Spark and big data technologies. And actually my first first training assignment was at your the former company, mm -hmm. Mito. 
I did a course there, and and from that point, the uh, whole thing just rocketed. People really wanted, and companies really wanted courses on big data and all that. So I started to freelance on teaching about big data, and then partnered up with Mate, my my partner in Data Power, to convert this freelance life uh, into you know, something more serious. And now here we are providing the services. And fortunately, we are still quite hands on. So I'm spending, for example, the last half a year, like four days a week on hands on projects, and we are doing data engineering, mostly for enterprises. What projects, tools or trends excite you these days? In the past years, um, I'm really focused on Spark and Databricks and cloud technologies. But I think what's great to have today is the data pipeline testing projects. You know, this project, perhaps great expectations. I tried to use it. It seemed that it's, it's still, you know, not major, but uh, let me just introduce it in, in one sentence for those of who, you who are not familiar with it. So when you create a pipeline, then you can have a lot of problems are you process data, data is missing, it's going, the expected distribution of data changes or whatever that can the signal that you have a bug in the pipeline or you need to reconfigure something. And this project, for example, it's an open source project, Great Expectations helps you mitigate these problems by adding checks in your pipeline. And we had this also back at Prezi, these kind of sanity checks, and also at a project I do now for an enterprise, we implement our sanity checks by hand. And it's, it's just great to see. I think that's really... Not a sexy thing because, you know, you, you just got to do it. No one will just say congrats because things are working, but it's great that someone took this and, and created an open source project. Yeah, so that's one. And the other one, I think that's also very subjective. That's uh, medical AI. I think that's, that's great. By this, I mean mostly image processing in medicine. So these algorithms are hitting the medical field. And there is a company I really love. It's uh, called Context Flow. That's an Austrian company. And what they do is they create a recommender system for radiologists. So if you're a radiologist, you get an image of one of your patients. And for example, you have a suspicion that something is off or something is a tumor or whatever like this. Then you just point at it and there is a database. And on the database, they are trying to get you similar images of that area from previous diagnoses and images. So you can just check what other practitioners thought about it. So I think there are there are a few very good initiatives like that in uh, medicine now that being data-driven and, and machine learning gets there. That one I'm really excited about. Actually, it's super nice to hear about because for me, this solution really sounds like AI-based power tool, like a Makita of data. So it's not like, you know, you have like AI magic and it solves a problem, but it gives like a very great tool for domain experts and practitioners to work with. Yeah, absolutely. How do you see the role of data changing in the next five years? What's clear now is that, that we've been moving to the cloud for the past 10 years or so. And I think moving to the cloud was a thing for startups like 10 years ago. And now that's also for enterprises. There are a lot of cloud migration projects and so this trend will, will continue. And also what it will take is that a lot of competence that will be needed will be somehow related to the cloud. They don't care too much that, for example, you are, you're into data warehousing and you understand how it works. What they care about is that, like, do you know Redshift? Do you know how to do that? I think that's definitely a trend, what we see. And also what we see is that we have more and more services focused. For example, if you want to do speech recognition, and not in English or German, but in, let's say, Hungarian, then you won't have a really good tool to reach it in the open source world. Or I'm not sure if what you have if you are up for paying for it, for an on-prem solution, but probably what you can do, and the only reasonable thing to do today would be to, to go to the Google Cloud, and you, you, ju you just get this and it just works 100%. What piece of advice would you give the ones who are just starting out their career and maybe especially in data engineering. So for data engineering, so I'm not sure I'm entitled to, to, to give any you know, really solid advice, but I know what worked for me. And I interviewed a bunch of people in the past 10 years for data engineering roles. So on one hand, there is a hygiene factor for data engineers and the hygiene factor is pretty much SQL, right? So you, you got to know SQL and learning SQL well, it would 
it would take an afternoon. So it's, it's super simple, but you get to know like 10 things about SQL because that's that's like the, the core language. And then of course it has some depth, but you got to know those because SQL is everywhere. And, and it seems that's actually a trend now, right? SQL is pretty much coming back and that's a very good trend. So SQL, and then what, what worked for me is to learn the language of uh, the DevOps people out there because as a data engineer and and tell me if you don't agree here, but for in my roles, we were at the mercy of DevOps. We, we had to execute pipelines and, and you know, if something went wrong, we, we got to go to the DevOps guys. It really means like how much credit you collect by the DevOps team. So you can always show up and they know that your question will be probably legit and you, you can figure it out yourself or, or you're just that random guy from the company who just takes the stupid questions there. And also just for, for normal data engineering, Linux and the bash and data processing in the command line, I think that's, that's super, super useful. Because you can do also some infrastructure engineering with that. And also, if you just have a CSV and you just want to do simple stuff, you, you won't need to fire up a notebook or pandas. You just execute the bash command and there you go with the results. Yeah, and also it's what, what we saw, and we do this in job interviews a lot, because it turns out useful is to, to make sure that people know their craft. And these are the boring things like computational complexity, like or how, how sorting works, or in a distributed system, how does a join work or a group by work. And this this knowledge was a very, very good indicator for us uh, in evaluating how successful we can cooperate with each other when we hire someone. Thank you so much. And I'm very grateful that you're actually sharing your experience trying to hire people and kind of trying to, you know, probe their knowledge. Thanks, Ani. And thanks for having me. If you are a data engineer and you feel like sharing your story, reach out. I'd be happy to chat with you. Hashmark, I, Data Engineer.